say here in the next 10 minutes. And every time I say that, I go like 40 minutes. But I, I promise, this, this, uh, this passage today, as we study these first seven verses, you're going to see how they connect a little bit more to chapter 3 uh, than anything. And uh, we'll just we'll, we'll, we'll get a few basic truths out of it, and then we'll be out of here this morning. But before we jump into that, I do just want to mention, I, I, I spoke with Brother uh, Kevin this morning, and uh, he just mentioned to me uh, to be in prayer for his stepfather. His uh, stepfather's got uh, cancer in his lungs, in his liver, and in his brain, three areas. And basically, uh, they've told him that uh, there's no more treatment that can be done or will be done. And uh, so basically, they're sending him to hospice. But uh, we want to just be praying for, uh, his name is Jack, be praying for him. And, um, and so, and just obviously the whole family, uh, Jack has put his faith in Christ. He is saved. Uh, so that's a great comfort uh, in a time like that. But, um, but let me just say, uh, going through something like that's got to be tough. Uh, it's tough on him physically uh, because of what cancer does. It just, it, um, um, it really attacks every part of your being, even your bones hurt. I mean, everything when you're battling cancer. So we just want to pray uh, for Jack that God would give him strength during this time uh, and then just pray for the family that, that God would comfort them. And then another prayer request that I would have you guys be praying for this week uh, is Brother Larry is going to be having an operation tomorrow uh, on his eyes. And, um, and so I told him I don't know what I'm praying for. If he, we want him to get more clear his eyes or less clear, right? Uh, uh, he might be scared when he sees my actual face. I don't know. Um, but, uh, but no, be praying for him as he'll be going into the operation tomorrow that God would just uh, uh, protect and, um, and be with the, the doctors as they perform uh, that, uh, that outpatient surgery. So uh, if we could, I'm going to ask, if, why don't we just pray real quick before we jump into the message. It's a short message anyway. Let's just pray and take time and ask God to, to be with those two requests. Father, this morning we come to you as we sang, not because of our merits, but because of Christ. We thank you that we have this privilege to come before your throne of grace in the time of need. And your word teaches us that in that time, as we go to you in prayer, we will not be denied, but we will be received. We will find help in this time of need. And Father, I think of these two needs today. I think of Jack that is going through this battle with cancer. Father, it's been something that many in our world have had to deal with. It's something that, as a society, we've hoarded and invested so much in trying to find a cure for. And Father, as of yet, we have not found one. And because of that, cancer has taken the lives of many. And Father, we see what it does when it brings hurt and when it brings the pain that it brings as it's coursing through the body. I, I read of many and known of many that have had to endure that. And Father, Jack is one of those that is going through that now. I pray, Father, that you would put your hand upon him. Father, that you would give him the strength needed to endure in these last a few, what it could be months, maybe days, I don't know. But in this last stage of life, I, under that shadow of death, that you as our, our great shepherd would be with him. That he might say as the psalmist, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. I pray that your presence would be with him now. I pray that your presence would be with his family as they uh, have to watch as cancer takes its toll. I, I pray that you would be with his wife. I pray that you would be with his children, that uh, they might uh, be an encouragement, a source of of uh, comfort to him, that the promises of your word would be the hope uh, that he holds on to and builds upon during this time. And then, Father, I also think of our second need for Brother Larry that's going and having this operation done tomorrow. I pray that you'd be with the doctors. I, I ask that you would be with every need that is there, uh, Father, that uh, everything would go, out, uh, go as planned and, and that there would be no... Um, complications in it, and, uh, and that at the end, Father, that uh, the purpose for the operation of restoring more of his sight would 
would uh, be successful. So be with him, be with the doctors, I pray. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. The gospel. The gospel transforms everything. It transforms our experience. We learned that in chapter 3, our legal standing before God. It changes and transforms our identity. We, we learned that last week. And what we're going to learn this morning is that it also transforms our future. It transforms everything, even our future. So before we read verse 1, go back to chapter 3 and look at verse number 26, and we'll go down uh, to chapter 4, verse 7. In chapter 3, verse 26 says, For ye are the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Heirs, becoming heirs of God. This chapter starts with this major truth that the gospel has upon our life. And that is it transforms our future to become heirs of God. Now, as Christians, we are to understand that the gospel brings us to full maturity in Christ, right? Uh, just like those of us that are parents and have babies, we, we, we want them to grow. We want them to be healthy as they're growing, as they're, as they're developing in their life. We want them to reach maturity. Right? We don't want them to stay in our house till they're 60 years old. Uh, they, they ought to be able to become independent at some point. We, we teach them uh, independent skills, right? We teach them how to brush their teeth. We, we teach them how to take a shower and put their clothes on. We, we, we kind of try to teach them things so that they become independent, knowing that one day they'll reach adulthood. One day they're not going to be living off of our paycheck. They're actually going to be making their own paycheck, right? In the Christian life, it's very much the same. The Bible says that when we come into faith, we are like babies in the faith. But we're not to remain babies. In 1 Peter chapter 2, he talks about, hey, those that are new in the faith are like babies, and we're, we're wanting the milk of the Word of God so that we can grow thereby. But we're not to remain that way the rest of our Christian life. We are to be growing, maturing in the Christian life. It's something so vital for us to understand and something that Paul wants uh, the, the Christians at Galatia to understand because what they were doing by going back to the law was they were staying babies. So in essence, Paul is saying, guys, grow up. It's time to grow up. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think about this theme, it does remind me of two commercials when I was growing up. All right, I'm 38, so those that were about... My age might remember these commercials. Those are in their 20s. Maybe, I don't even think the commercial is playing anymore. But it was an awesome commercial. One was by Toys R Us. Toys R Us was a company that used to sell a lot of toys. All right? For those that are really young, we used to have one here in McAllen right by the mall. Closed down already. They filed, I think, for Chapter 11. But anyways, they used, that used to be the store all right, before Amazon came and ruined everything for everyone. It was Toys R Us. Okay, and in the commercial, they had a little jingle, and, and you know, these commercials, they have these songs, and then you, you're like, you first watch them, you're like, this is so dumb, and then later in the day, you're at work, and you're like, singing the song, because, I don't know, they're catchy, and Toys R Us had one of these catchy ones, right, uh, the, the song said, I don't want to grow up, I'm a Toys R Us kid, there's a million toys in Toys R Us that I can play with, 
And the whole idea of that song and that commercial is don't grow up. Because grown-ups don't like buying toys. But if you can stay a little kid and immature, you can go and buy toys at Toys R Us. It was a very brilliant song for their campaign to keep people coming and buying toys. Now, I feel like that had a very big impact in my life because I still buy toys. All right, if you've been in my house, you know, I'm proud of my toys. But that was one commercial. The idea, don't grow up. Then there was another commercial that was by Huggies, all right, the pull-up commercial. I don't know. if This was in the 90s, so I don't know if they still play it or not. Um, TV has changed so much that does anybody still watch regular, like, cable television? Or is everybody? Okay. A few of us are still? Okay. Most of us are like YouTube or cable where it's on demand kind of thing. Anyways, there was a commercial. So there's less commercials that way for that reason. But uh, there's a Huggies commercial uh, that was about pull-ups. And it also had a song. And uh, it had like a little line at the end of the song. And it would say, Mommy, wow. What are the next words? Yes, thank you. There's my generation. I'm a big kid now with the idea of Dude, you're growing up. And, you know, in the commercial, the parent was showing the little toddler, you know, using the restroom, then using the pull-up, and, and everybody's happy because they're growing. What Paul wants to tell the Galatian church, guys, y'all need to be pull-up kids, not Toys R Us kids, okay? You should be growing to maturity, not staying in immaturity. By living the law and staying within the law, all they were doing was living immature lives. So chapter 4 is all about growing up. And one of the ideas of growing up is this thing of becoming an heir. Okay? So I'm going to give you two quick points, and we'll be out of here. It's 1221. Two quick points. Number one in your notes. When it comes to this of heirs, what is an heir? Let me tell you first of all, give you the definition, because I don't think I put it in your notes. Let me give you the definition of an heir. An heir, according to Google, is a person legally entitled to the property or rank of another, all right? An heir is a person legally entitled to the property or rank of another. Now, today, when we think of an inheritance, we think of getting that property that we're entitled to after the person dies. Normally, that's how it works in our society in Western culture. In this society, in the Middle Eastern culture, where Paul was writing to the People of Galatia, that's not how it works, okay? You would receive an inheritance the moment that you became a certain age. So you didn't have to wait to the parent or the person that's going to give you this inheritance passes away. Actually, you just had to reach a certain age, and then you would become an heir. So there are two kinds of errors then that Paul is talking about or that we can see in this passage. The first one there in your notes is the immature error, the immature error, all right? In verse number one, notice that he says this about the immature. I, he says, now, I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. The immature heir is one that has the title, but not the age of maturity to receive the inheritance, okay? An immature heir is one that he's too young to receive the inheritance of his father. Now, when a son was too young for that, that's when, and we studied this in chapter 3, they would give them a schoolmaster, right? The schoolmaster was that person that was going to tutor them, work with them, be there with them, helping them to get to the age of maturity. Now, Paul is playing on that thought that he started in chapter 3 and he's continuing it in chapter 4 and saying, the immature error is the one that hasn't reached that yet. So what did that immature have to do? He had to follow what was taught to them. Okay? So the tutor would sit there and help him with grades, his homework on grade school. Some of the tutors and most of them were their actual teachers as well. Right? So they were assigned to uh, teach them and educate them. They were assigned to teach them manners and customs. Okay? The parent, if they were a wealthy family, and I'm talking about even in the Jewish culture, Roman, Greek, or Jewish culture, this is what they would do. They would have, if they were a, a well-to-do family, they would have that schoolmaster teaching them and bringing them along to get to the age of maturity. So the immature heir is one that 
in all practicality, was no different than a slave. Even though, hey, that's the, that's the uh, homeowner's son. Like, this is really his house. I mean, these possessions are all really his, and yet, because he hasn't reached that age of maturity, then there's nothing for him yet. In fact, he's living the life basically of a slave, in bondage. Whatever the schoolmaster tells him to do, he has to do. They weren't given uh, any kind of rights. They couldn't be like, well, I'm the boss. I, my dad is, is, your, is your boss. Yeah, that might be true, but you're not. And because he's my boss and you're not, you're still going to do what I'm saying. That's what the schoolmaster would teach this immature heir as he was going, as he was leading them there. And, uh, and like I said, it was something, and by the way, I put Genesis 24 in your notes because I want to show you that even in the Jewish culture, this is what they did. Abraham did that for his son. So we find that an immature heir has to follow whatever's taught to him by his schoolmaster. And secondly, he's in bondage. The second, one, uh, the, the second truth about that is he's in bondage. They were slaves in practice. Okay? Uh, they could not do as they pleased. They could not have freedom to leave or they can have authority to command anyone because he was still immature. He had to constantly be in obedience following the tutors until the time came when he could be an heir, a complete, and give or receive his inheritance. Now, there's a word, and we're going to talk about it in the next point of the mature error. But you can underline the word son. For we are sons. In verse 6, that's very important because that, that word was specifically used for people that were adults. We use the term son for anyone that is, of course, um, younger, right? So uh, if, if you have a son that's 25, you would say, yeah, he's my son. If he was 10 or 5 years old, you'd say, he's still my son. He, we use the same term for the same thing. But... Where we, where we are a little bit more specific in the English language, we would say, well, he's a teenager, or he's an adult, or he's a child. We would specify. When we say use the word child, we would think of someone younger. When you say teenager, a little bit older, obviously between 13 and 18 or so. And then when we say an adult, we're saying, oh, it's someone that is already able to make his own decisions in life. The word son has the idea of adult in the Greek here. So we'll jump into that in a minute. The immature one. Let me just go back to that. The immature error then is one who's not meet, reached maturity. He has to do what has been taught to him, and he's constantly in bondage. Here's what Paul is saying. Those that are living under the law are immature. You got saved. You were transformed by the gospel. Your legal standing before God has changed. Your experience in God has changed. Your identity of who you are has changed. But if you go back to living under the law, all you're doing is putting yourself back under bondage. You're not living like an heir as a son of God, an adult son of God. You are like a child. You're immature. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul said it this way. He says, Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances, taste not, uh, touch not, handle not, which are all to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. Paul is saying, uh, that, that, that word, by the way, rudiments, is the same word that he uses in chapter 4 and verse 3. When we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. The, the basic thing, that, that idea, that phrase is the ABCs. Right? Everyone needs to know the ABCs if you're going to read, right? You've got to know your, if you don't know the alphabet, you're probably illiterate. That means you don't know how to read, okay? You need to know the alphabet. But who do we teach the alphabet to? To those that don't have the understanding to read yet. We give them that so that later... They can read documents, they can sign documents, they can acquire things. Paul is saying, when you're living under the bondage of the law, you're immature, and you're going and just doing the ABCs, and you're not getting further than that. You're missing the point of why the ABCs are given to you. The ABCs, the alphabet's not given to us so that we can learn a song that's nice and rhymy. We don't teach kids A, B, C, D, E, F, G. 
the song just so that they know a new song. We're teaching them so they can start memorizing, oh, this is how letters work and this is the sounds they make. So that we can get to them to a point, about around first grade at six or so, seven, where they can start reading on their own. Paul is saying, when you live just according to the law, well, now you've got to get circumcised. Now you've got to follow all the, 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 the commandments of God. And if you, if you mess them up, then, then you're not really growing in maturity. Paul says that's not the point of the law. The point of the law is not to get us to, to that maturity. It never can. The gospel does that. The law cannot. The law, you know what it does? It keeps you like a little kid, immature. It keeps you with the elements of this world, the rudiments of this world. So, the mature error, number two here, the mature error, and we'll be done. This was the person or the, the, the young child who had reached the age in their life that the father had appointed for them to begin to lead and act as the leader. No longer would they be living as a slave, following their schoolmaster and their tutors and their governors, but now they're the boss. Now the father said, you got to this age, now you're in charge. And normally in these cultures is around the age of 25. At about 25, it would range differently because every father would appoint the age that they thought their son would be able to reach maturity and to become the heir of their inheritance. And so typically in that time, you'd appoint, and once you got there, now you had the inheritance. Now, when you became an heir that way, you were recognized by that coming of age. There in your notes, you were recognized by that coming of age. All right? Um, and by the way, when Jesus was telling parables and stories to try to give and help us understand eternal truths, um, he mentioned this in, in Luke chapter 15. You know the, the story of the prodigal son? You remember the, the man that had two sons and one of them was just rebellious? Notice what he did, how he started his rebellion in verse number 11. I put it in your notes. And he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided into them his living. In other words, he hadn't reached maturity. And he was telling his dad, I just want my inheritance. And the father said, okay. And gave him his inheritance. He didn't wait to grow into maturity. And what did he do with that inheritance? Wasted it all away. So this idea was pretty strong in the minds of people during this time. For, for us, we have to study it to kind of figure out, okay, I see what he's saying. But in their mind, this would have stuck right away. Oh, oh, that kid's doing that? Okay. That's not, that's not good. What, a, what an immature little brat not understand. He thinks he knows the world. Sadly, I think all of us at our teenage years got to that point, right? But the mature error is the person that is recognized by coming to the age that the father appointed and said, now you're ready to inherit. Now you're ready to handle what I'm giving to you. Look at verse number four, what Paul says. Chapter four, verse number four, but... When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, and made her under the law. When do we become mature heirs in our Christian life? Is it by keeping commandments? Is it by being a Christian for 25 years? So now that, hey, we're coming of age. Can I say this morning, it's not by that. I heard someone say this, and I agree with them. They said, maturity doesn't come with age. It comes with the acceptance of responsibility. You could be a 35-year-old and still be very immature in your thinking and in the way you live and what you do. As you begin to learn to take on responsibility, as you learn that, that skill, then your maturity starts to grow. Okay? Paul is saying, when the fullness of time came, what gave us the inheritance that we have? Not coming to church, not putting on a tie and a suit, not preaching on a platform, no. Christ on the cross gave us the price that he paid, the gospel 
gave us our inheritance, made us heirs, made us adults, sons of God. That's the word son, an adult heir. Paul says that, that, that's where our inheritance comes from. That's who we've been made to be. So if you go back to living under the law, you know what you're doing? You're, you're acting very immature. And at the same time, not only are you acting immature, it's not getting the, you any closer to where God wants you to be. No. Now, if I can make it into maybe verbiage of our day and age today, it means our good works don't really matter to make us more spiritual. We're not made spiritual by our good works. We're made spiritual by God's work on the cross. Our good works flow from that. Uh, maybe you've heard the saying, um, I need to eat to live, but not live to eat. Right? There's a difference there. Someone said it this way in a doctrinal sense. They say, I don't work for my salvation. I work from my salvation. In other words, because I'm saved, I do good works. I don't do good works to get saved. Christ did the work there. But because he's made me now his child, now he says, now I want you to do this works. Why? So that others might glorify me. It's not for our glory. It's not to say, look how spiritual that guy is. No. It's to say, look, look at the work that God has done in that guy's life, in that lady's life. It's amazing. The mature error is recognized with the coming of age, with the maturity, and that coming of age comes through sonship. So now he would not be referred simply as the heir, but he would be referred to as the son. All titles and deeds would be bestowed on him as the heir and the one to lead. Romans chapter 8, verse 15 to verse 17, Paul kind of expounds on that thought. He kind of gets it bigger. I won't read it, but you can read it later. As Christians, our sonship allows us to now call God our Father. And we're now co-heirs with Christ. That's why Paul says, after in verse number 4, he said, the fullness of time came. God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. That was us. We were under the law. That we might re receive the adoption of sons. There's that word sons to say Adult children heirs. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, there art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. He's saying this is how you and I become heirs of God. It was through the faith of what Christ did on the cross. When he, when he died on the cross and when we received him, he automatically put us in a category of son. What the law did, did the purpose of the law, we, we learned this, it was a schoolmaster. It was to try to help us to learn, help the people to learn that when they see Jesus, when God sends his son, we will be so convinced of how sinful we are and how much we need forgiveness and the redemption of God that we will follow his son. But sadly, there were many that rejected that. They didn't want to grow up. They said, we're okay. We'll stay in our law. Because the law makes me feel good. It works to our selfishness and our pride. When we follow the law, we kind of feel like, I'm not that bad. I mean, I ain't perfect, but I ain't Oscar either. I mean, he's bad. I'm a little bad. The, the law helped us to kind of try to compare ourselves. And that's why Paul said, comparing themselves among themselves, they are not wise. They're foolish. It's a foolish thing to do. It's an immature thing to do. What did God, the gospel do? It put us in a position where we're adult sons, and now we're joint heirs with Christ. That's what Romans chapter 8, verse 15 and 16 say. Now we can call God our Father, the Spirit of God indwells in us, and we are heirs, heirs, and joint heirs with Christ. 
if so be that we suffer with him. Paul says, okay, Galatians, it's time to grow up. If you want to stay in the law, if you want to follow that teaching of Judaism, you're going to stay immature all your life. Now, but pastor, we have to wear ties to church. No, you don't. That's putting some standard above what God has made us to be. We're joint heirs with Christ. We're not living under law. We have freedom. Freedom. We've been co-heirs with Christ. So, how do you live the life of an heir? I hate to cut the message short. Next week, we're going to talk about that. Because that's what all of chapter 4 is about, okay? And then chapter 5 expands that even bigger. I tell you, this, this book's only going to get better and better every week. So, my thought for you to take home today, are you growing? Are you growing? Because God has put you in a place to grow fully. So don't tie yourself down with rules and regulations. doesn't mean that rules and regulations are bad or evil. Okay, I'm glad there's speed limits and stop signs and red lights. We need that. There would be a whole lot more accidents if not. Paul's not saying that the Ten Commandments are bad or evil. What he's saying is that's not going to help you reach maturity in the Christian life. Living by that doesn't make you a better Christian and make you super spiritual and more and better and more loved by God than anybody else. That's not what that does. All that the law was supposed to do is just remind you, you know what? You're not as good as you think you are. And you know what? We need redemption. We need a new father. And that's what Paul says, and that's what you're missing when you live under the law. You're just making yourself come under bondage. Don't do that. It's a very frustrating life. It's a life where you don't really find a lot of joy. It's a very performance-driven life. And by the way, how many have ever been stressed by that, right, at work? Got to impress my boss. I got to impress my boss. And sometimes that creeps into our Christian life. I got to impress God. I got to impress God how good I am. And I says, no, you don't. <laughs> Listen, you're only good because I made you good. And now we live good because we are heirs. Adult sons mature to live differently, to be growing in a way that's different than before. Let's take that with us next week. How do we do that? What does that mean to live in that heir as a son of God? We'll talk about that next week. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this truth of what you've made us to be. And the gospel really is amazing. It really has changed our experience. And we feel it every time we come and hear your word, every time we sing the praises and the worship songs that we sing, we feel that presence, that difference. But it's also changed how you view us and how we are to view you. It's changed who we are in our identity. Wow, has it changed our future. The inheritance that you've given us is not just being joined in our family, making us adult sons of yours. But now you've given us the promises that were given to your son. Now we can see why your word says because he lives we too shall live because we're heirs with him now we understand father that because he reigns we will reign with him truths that are deep and profound sometimes more than what our minds can fully comprehend and though we may not be able to comprehend totally what all that means it does make for an awesome future, a bright future. Father, I pray that we would always be mindful of what we've been made to be, growing as heirs and sons of God. Help us, Father, to be appreciative of what we've received. And in that, 
and that joy and that just amazing thought of being your children that, Father, we would just be grateful of being made heirs, not by our works, not determined by how many commandments we keep or how many years have gone by. No, Father, that that appointment came when you sent your son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. We died with him. We live with him. How amazing of a truth that is. And we never get over that. Help us to ponder this truth, Father, today. We have a heart and a mind ready to grow and to act as the mature heirs that you've made us to be. And we ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.